Born and raised in the community of Rundle, so Northeast Calgary girl, lived in Northeast Calgary up until the age of 42. And um, so I'm not there anymore, but uh, I, uh, you know, I have two brothers and, uh, you know, it was quite interesting growing up in the 70s in, in that quadrant of the city because there was not very much ethnic diversity. It's not like what it is now. It's like my mom and dad coming from India had very defined values and very much of a great attachment to their home country. So I would go to school and be, you know, exposed to a very Western way of living and a Western way of thinking. And then I'd come home and it would be a very Eastern way of living. And it was tough because I wasn't really allowed to do anything, whereas my brothers had more freedom. So just trying to navigate through that was always a challenge. I know that it was before kindergarten. I have an older brother who's four years older than I am, and he was already in the school system. And we had uh, neighbors who lived across the street from us, and they had two children about the same age as I was. and. So I remember going over to their home and kind of knocking on their door because their their son was about the same age as me and uh, just asking if he could come out and play. And his mom, I mean, she was Caucasian, looked me up and down and she said, you know what? I would invite you in, but you're too dirty. So, and so I went home literally feeling, believing that I was dirty, and but I wasn't obviously. But that was the first time, and it happened multiple times with this family where there was a real othering, right? Like there's us, and there's the rest of the children in the neighborhood, and then there's you. Because the other thing that used to happen all the time was uh, packy, 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 everywhere we went, you know, you're a packy, and you know, your families are and from Pakistan, and you guys smell, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, and my father, who was born in Pakistan, actually, my parents are from India, he actually sat me down and he said, you know, the word Pak, P-A-K, it actually means pure. That's the meaning of that word. So Pakistan is a pure land. And when somebody is calling you Paki, you have to understand that they don't know what they're saying. They're actually calling you pure. So, I also have a brother who's four years younger. And... Um, so I, I felt very protective of him. He used to get picked on quite a bit. So I have been in a lot of fights <laughs> growing up to um, keep an eye on him and uh, and also to, you know, to protect myself as well. So I'm talking full on fist fights, that kind of thing. And I have been attacked multiple times growing up. And so what that means is that you become fearful, number one, of certain kinds of people and you just know uh, who to avoid and you know are you going to have an arranged marriage or you know your English is so great and are your parents like this and are you you know you're a girl are you allowed to wear dresses you know it was always it was such a headache it was so much there's so many barriers that you had to jump before you came to that point of meeting of the minds. It wasn't like that with everybody. So there was always such a tendency to kind of, you know, seek out other people from the South Asian community because you just knew. You didn't have to <laughs> talk about all of these other subject matters. You just knew what, what the other person's experience was and they understood your experience. So you just kind of jumped past all of that, like somebody from a South Asian background, Chinese background, Asian backgrounds in general, are seen through a stereotypical lens that somehow their upbringing makes them more likely to be successful because of their family values and things like that. Whereas maybe somebody from a, a South American background, because their upbringing is different and they don't have that same emphasis on hard work and studying, et cetera, et cetera, that they might not be as successful. And this is a very damaging thing because you are held to a standard that is not realistic. So the dichotomy and this debate, even amongst racialized communities, as to who is the most oppressed, as you were saying earlier. It doesn't happen often. In, in fact, I would I would actually like to emphasize the other conversations that happen, a commonality of understanding, people really coming together and saying, hey, 
This is an experience that's common to all of us. Maybe the experience is different. It's different in degrees. But at the end of the day, it has to stop. Whenever there is disease, there is fear. And wherever there is fear, there is an uptick in racism. And that's exactly what we're seeing. And, um, you know, we can, both you and I can share many um incidents that we've heard of recently where um, people from the Asian communities have been targeted. And I really do take it back to that fear component, right? And we have prominent people across the world and Donald Trump to name one who actually fanned the flames of that fear, you know. It's tough because I see it every day. Um, Northeast Calgary, hardest hit area of the province, perhaps even the continent in terms of um, per capita numbers. And um, it always comes back to finger pointing at certain communities and that's a problem. It's not, it's not right and it's not true. You know, there are real barriers for racialized women to uh, get to higher levels. And, you know, the data actually supports that. If you look at, um, you know, some of the top corporations across North America, the number of women in the C-suite, it's one in five, but the number of racialized women in the C-suites, it's far, far lower than that. And so because of the experiences that I have had and because of the lack of diversity and inclusion policies in some of the major organizations that I've worked in, I have now decided to take a more vocal stance on this matter. And the other thing that I've... Um, pledge to do is uh, is to open doors. So everywhere I can, uh, when I'm talking to organizations and businesses, I talk about diversity and inclusion, and I ask them to open more doors for other people to come in. Because it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen unless we're intentional about it and we make it a priority. So I just wanted to make sure that I said that because if that message gets out, I want people to hear it. It's not just about me getting to a certain platform. It's like, how am I going to use this platform so I can get a thousand other brown girls behind me into the door so they can do something uh, similar to what I'm doing now. And, uh, you know, I'm proudly uh, celebrating the achievements of Asians uh, during Asian Heritage Month as well. And so Asian is East Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asian, Asian all together and the accomplishments are many like if we think back to our Chinese Canadian community and how they contributed to the construction of uh, Canadian Pacific Railways and I'm from um, a Sikh background as well so there's a rich heritage of the uh, Sikh Canadians coming here and also contributing immensely to infrastructure and to the economy and I think given um, some of the historical mishaps that have happened with um, governments in terms of how they have treated those from the Asian communities, to actually talk about the successes now is, is very important, just to make sure that historically that people know. Asians have been around for a long, long time, for way more than a century. And, uh, and sometimes that's not really included in the history books. It's not really included in curricula. Um, you know, myself as a politician, we have to speak up a little bit more so folks really understand the rich tapestry and the rich history behind the community.